This week on Tequila Sunrise, we're talking to a veteran in every sense of the word. Technology, military, and just life in general. Listen up to what Kevin L. Jackson can tell you about his life story and what he wants you to take away from it. You know what to do. Listen up. It's time to wake up to Tequila Sunrise, where, without the aid of tequila, unfortunately, we open your eyes to how tech, founders, and venture investing ticks. Focused on supply chain tech every week at this unholy hour of the day. So if you want to know how tech startup growth and investment is done, join me every single week for another blinding Tequila Sunrise. Greg White here from Supply Chain Now, always happy, never satisfied, willing to acknowledge reality but refusing to be bound by it. My goal is to inform, enlighten, and inspire you in your own supply chain tech journey. Subscribe to Tequila Sunrise on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else you get your podcasts so you don't miss a thing. first half of our interview with Kevin L. Jackson. All right, let's bring in our guest, Kevin L. Jackson. Kevin is CEO and founder of GC Global Net, a global social networking and consulting platform aiming at educating small businesses and large corporations on cloud computing. And you're going to hear why he's eminently qualified to do that. But wait, there's more. Kevin's list of current endeavors is as long as my arm I could just send you to his Wikipedia page or his personal website, but I really wanted to pick a few of these things and and highlight some of my favorites. So Kevin is a graduate of the Naval Academy, a BS in aerospace engineering. So when he says it's not rocket science, he knows. He's also uh, holds an MA in national security and strategic studies with the Naval War College. And as if that isn't enough, and gosh, don't you think it ought to be a master's in electrical engineering from Navy postgraduate school. 15 years in the Navy, a Lieutenant Commander, Carrier Aviator, and Spacecraft Systems Engineer. Kevin previously has led technology at numerous firms in the military, finance, and technology industries. He is currently also an adjunct professor in Applied Computing Systems and Technology at Tulane University, Green Wave, Strategic advisor to Total Network Service in the crypto industry and strategic advisor to Dealbox, who is out to democratize wealth by democratizing venture capital. Author of Click to Transform Digital Transformation Game Plan for Your Business as of this moment. Number one new release on Amazon. I checked right before the show. Kevin, thanks for joining us. First of all, I don't know how you have time. But I'm glad that you have chosen to share a little bit of time with us. And it's particularly an honor to get some of your time knowing how hard that is. (laughs) No, thank you very much. I was wondering. I didn't recognize the person you were talking about. (laughs) It sounds really good when somebody else says it, doesn't it? It makes you feel Uh, really, really. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm blushing. Can you see? (laughs) Yeah, I can. (laughs) (laughs) So. Let's uh, let's dive into this. I really appreciate you being here. I've actually talked to you several times on Supply Chain Now. This is the yeah. first time you and I have gotten to talk without adult supervision. The great it's Scott be Luton. Scary. Right? Yeah. We, uh, this know, could get uh, dangerous. You sure? You sure Scott's not going to bust into your room there in a second? <laughs> I'm sure he's observing from somewhere, right? <laughs> well, look. So. We know even just a tiny bit about your education and your career days. First of all, thank you for your service. Thank you for everything you've done since that to help, you know, with digital transformation, with cloud, with other technologies, cybersecurity. I mean, you've had your hands in everything. So Mm -hmm. we'll talk more about your journey a little bit later. But what we don't know anything about is those 12 years in the desert, Kevin. Tell us a little bit about your youth, about your about your parents, your hometown? What kind of kid were you growing up? Oh, wow. That's, um, you know, I'm glad you didn't ask me, where are you from? (laughs) Because (laughs) 
that can be a very difficult uh, uh, question because uh, my family moved around around quite a bit. Well, my, my parents though, were both born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. So I guess you could call that home because that's where my extended family is. But I actually never lived there other than like going and staying with my uh, grandmother over the summer or staying a few months there, here and there. Uh, Weddings but it's, and it's always graduations like, and whatnot. Yeah, right. graduations and whatnot. So I'm always in Baltimore. But uh, my my father was actually for a short time in the Army as an electronic technician. And, and I was born right there in Atlanta, believe it or not, in wow. Fort McPherson. Um, <laughs> wow, at Fort McPherson. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That's where I was born. That's where I started. And then we moved to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. My father was a, he left the army and he was a civilian in the Air Force and he taught um, electronics for the Air Force at Keesley Air Force Base for a short while. Then we moved to New Orleans where, believe it or not, my father worked on the Apollo moon rocket, uh, the third stage. Uh, wow. Mc McDonnell Douglas there in uh, New Orleans. And then, uh, he finally settled in with the FAA, 30 plus year career with the FAA as a aviation facilities engineer. You know, all the technology that uh, routes the planes and. Oh, yeah, the air traffic control and system and all that. That's what he was responsible for. OK, actually, he uh, retired. He was at FAA headquarters running uh, quite a large component of the FAA. So we moved to New Jersey and the District of Columbia, D.C., and Louisville, Kentucky, and, you know, so all over the place. So I'm from the United States, but my, my mom was a, a nurse all those years. So she worked in hospitals in all those cities. <laughs> Man, well, I can see, one, why you embrace so much going on so much change and also why electronics why aerospace why military um, well, I mean, that I, had to have had a big influence on you so look you know i grew up in the 60s right so i was always into space travel and i'm sure my father working on the moon rocket was was quite an influence but my uh, earliest memories really a revolve around wanting to emulate the early astronauts and Star Trek. And I know I looked in your past, you're a Trekkie yourself. <laughs> <laughs> How could you not be in those days, man? I mean, it, you know, it was by the time I was watching it, it was, I think it was reruns. I don't even remember. Star Trek was only just a few seasons, right? But yeah, um, and I saw and it was on ones. all the time. That's how old I am. <laughs> What's that? I saw the original one, so that's how <laughs> old I am. <laughs> I'll never give you up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, I mean, it was a special time, wasn't it? I mean, there was a lot going on all the way through the 60s, all the way through the 80s. Space was the final frontier. Right? Yeah, right. To quote the and, show. And, so. and I guess also uh, growing up on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, the fight for civil rights was really my everyday experience. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I remember being in fourth grade and watching the KKK parading outside of my house. Oh, not my house, it was my school, actually. And, and uh, being told during, you know, show and tell, one of yep. the classmates brought in a microscope and everybody was lined up to uh, uh, look through the microscope, you know, in fourth grade. And when it was time, time for me to look at it, you know, the uh, little kid, I distinctly remember saying, I don't want that N-word look touching my microscope, right? And, uh, and uh, the teacher actually saying, well, if he doesn't want you touching his microscope, you can't touch his microscope. So I never got to look at the microscope. Oh, man. That, you know? <laughs> I'm, of course, appalled but fascinated by these stories because I grew up in mostly in Kansas. I'd moved around like you, but mm -hmm. mostly in Kansas. And it was distinctly different. I can't say that, uh, you know, of course, I would never experience what you've experienced, but 
I feel like there's a lot more unity, comfort, well, the acceptance. Has quite a bit. A, still astounding to me to hear that that stuff happens when I have friends who, who not not even in you know in when in the days when you were a kid, but in the fairly recent past have had things like that happen. It's just foreign to me that people think that way. I guess. How, how do you well, think that? I mean, how how much of that happened? Kevin, and how much do you think that impacted you and and your clear and present drive and initiative <laughs> or your goals as a person? Well, yes, it absolutely happens. And it still happens in, in today's world. But it can either make you stronger or it can destroy you. And in, in, in my case, it it taught me really don't listen to others. Don't let others determine your fate and to always move forward and, and trust in yourself. And I think that really came from, from my parents. I mean, they taught me to always strive for yourself, strive for your future, and don't let others put you down. So um, that really became my DNA. <laughs> and and that has, has, has driven me my, my entire life. Even when the, you know, the high school counselor tell, tells me that you are not good enough to uh, go to college, you should go get a, a good job at the Ford plant on the assembly line. You know, you can't let others uh, determine your future. Yeah, I think that's a particularly poignant message now. I, I think that's a struggle. I mean, I see it. You can see mm -hmm. the sort of uh, hopelessness or helplessness that certain people have. And I, I really want to give them that guidance. I really want to give them that hope that nobody defines your future. Right. You. And so. it's also important for education. It's, it's, it's critical that you learn about the world and learn from others, but don't take them on their word, <laughs> you know, when when we were young, your whatever your parents said was true. That had a lot of influence on everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, today, like when my kids were were growing up, as they got older, I mean, you would say something, but they'd just go to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And bust That's right. you on it. <laughs> no, Dad. Right. <laughs> no, Dad. Right. Exactly. <laughs> But what's happening now, though, in the early days of the Internet, most of the information on the Internet was actually good. It was actually right. true. But nowadays, it's actually maybe flipping where much of the information, because it is, um, I guess, exciting, <laughs> but it's lies. It's wrong. <laughs> it's false. Or, so, or at least it's, what do you want to say, hyperbolic, right? Yeah. Yeah, right, you're right. Exactly. You're you're absolutely right. And it, uh, you know, we that's what we've encouraged our kids and I bet you have too is to look at both sides. And as my great grandparents used to tell me, there's his side, her side and the truth, right? So <laughs> Right, right. Um so that I mean I, I think you really have to be discerning about that. And I, I started recognizing that a lot when mm -hmm. well, look, who cares what I think? I want to know when you started recognizing that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm used to just talking to you, Kevin. So, <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> hey, here's what I think. Well, so what did you do as a kid? I mean, I know you must have done something besides work at seven places at once oh, as a yeah. kid. So, what did you do as a kid? What did you do for fun? Or, well, you know, like I said before, I was. The space age, right? So, of course, I built model rockets and, and launched them. Did you really? Um, yeah. <laughs> wow. And I um, actually got into bowling when I was young, and and I've carried that uh, until in the pre-COVID age. <laughs> my family and uh, my wife and kids, we were in every type of bowling league you could imagine. You know? Really? Really, really enjoyed that as as a family. What's your average? Uh, well, when I was bowling, my average is about 185, 186. That's solid. Uh, oh, yeah. But my son has like 
eight 300 ring. So, <laughs> so I'm not even. Uh... <laughs> that, that's harsh when, yeah, when your kids get better than you. Yeah. <laughs> that's when a lot of parents hang it up on a sport, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know. Dad, let's go both. No, nah, it's okay. <laughs> uh, I don't but, think so. Uh, but even, even today, I uh, keep tabs on SpaceX and uh, commercial space. But about 10 years ago, I started writing my blog as a hobby, Cloud Musings. And then that blossomed into full-time writing in social media and, and my books. So, uh, But that sort of goes back to what we were saying before, work shouldn't be work. It should be something that you enjoy. Uh, and I've been lucky in that things that I enjoy doing have been able to help me pay my bills. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, that's so I, that's a, a bit of luck I've, I've had. So I enjoy social media, but I just so happen to be a social media influencer. That yeah, you, for at least two companies, Broadcom and at and I think, correct? Or Yeah, and Ericsson and IBM and Intel and Microsoft and many others. I yep, actually... That's right. That's right. <laughs> and you've done something with Dell as well. Um, yes, Dell that's not and... social media, though. That was a technology well, council or something, right? Yeah, and also at some of the events like uh, VMware and Dell, I, I, I do, I guess, thought leadership pieces. I do yeah. a, a lot of writing. So, <laughs> all right. So I, I got to ask you, what are you not good at? <laughs> seriously. I mean, not seriously, there's got to be something that you're not good at. You know, I can't imagine what it could be. <laughs> no, I, I mean, ask my wife. She has a long list. <laughs> she's she's next on the interview list <laughs> but you know i'm i'm horrible at details you know i'm, I'm a big picture kind of guy mm. and as soon as you got to get down to the details i'll say okay somebody else come along <laughs> that's good to know how about sports are you a fan of anything so, you like I see. Is that the uh, Washington football team jersey behind you? <laughs> uh, no. Okay. That's why all the, all the Cowboys fans hate me is they think that is, they yeah, think that's, right. yeah, th that's actually, uh, that is my favorite football player ever. The one who inspired me to play football, Otis Taylor from the Kansas city chiefs. No, okay. That's Kansas city. Well, red. whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Hey man, I paid my dues 50 years of waiting. <laughs> we're a great team i'm happy i'm happy well, now so. yeah but big in the football i mean uh you know with my uh family being from baltimore they were the heydays of the uh baltimore Colts. colts before, yeah uh, they, burt jones yeah yeah and uh so now and i hate the colts <laughs> <laughs> right, because they moved to Indy, right? Yeah, when they got the, the moving vans and left Baltimore. Yeah. <laughs> so are you a Ravens fan? So my my father, my father is a um season ticket holder for the Ravens. Wow. That that um, does you my any good family this is season. A big but... Ravens fan. Yeah. And my father in law is a big Redskins. Oh, I mean, sorry. Washington football, football team. Yeah, we got to get it. <laughs> I think we ought to take a poll here for what they ought to be called. <laughs> right. As long as my and my son, my son is a huge Washington fan. Is he? Uh, so um, I I'm a uh, Raven skin. Are you OK? <laughs> yeah, you've got to you got to walk a fine line there. But at least, the line. You, at least you've always got something to do on Thanksgiving Day because they play. <laughs> right, right. Washington plays almost every Thanksgiving. You because of when you grew up, I could so, totally see that. I remember Burt Jones and yeah, the Colts. Johnny Unitas. Johnny U, of course. My, yeah. my first football game was in uh, Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, watching yep. Johnny Unitas play. Wow. <laughs> Man, what an incredible quarterback, the prototypical quarterback. And Washington had some some great quarterbacks too. I'm trying to think. Was he Jurgensen? Yeah, Sonny Jer Sonny Jurgensen, right. Number right. 18. All right. So I feel like we've gotten to know a little bit 
about your childhood. Obviously you moved around. Do you, I mean, do you feel like that gave you kind of some of the ability to multitask to address things at a high level? And, and obviously, you know, you relate at least one experience that kind of drives you to excel. Actually, I think it did because it taught me the value of change and how to look at things from multiple points of views, how to appreciate, you know, the other person's viewpoint. Uh, and empathy is a very important aspect of, of leadership. Amen. And, yeah. I, and I think the ability to understand other viewpoints, to understand um, that people have different backgrounds. And by moving around, I was able to experience a bit of a lot of different things. Lived on the West Coast, East Coast. I've been overseas. I've been around the world, right? Mm. So you really can uh, engage with other people, with other backgrounds and other thoughts in a constructive manner. Um, I think that's- Even if their thoughts are stupid. Yeah. I mean, I mean there is arguably, thing, right? Stupid, even if but you, you don't up, tell people that, right? Right. I, I mean, even if you arguably might think their thoughts are ignorant or oppressive or whatever, you you can by having experienced it so much, you can actually see where they're coming from, whether it's yeah. justifiable or justification or not. Um, you can actually see where people are coming from. Right. And having that appreciation is important when you want to come to some type of an agreement to work mm -hmm. forward. That's a really interesting perspective. I had not really kind of thought of it that way until you, you were saying that, but <laughs> it, it doesn't matter what somebody's position is. You can create empathy for it, even if only to find agreement or to exactly. avoid conflict. Right. Exactly. So, all right. So let's jump forward a little bit to maybe your, certainly to your education. I'm fascinated by that and your, and maybe even your early career days, but mm -hmm. can you pin down one or two things, happenings or experiences or mentors or anything like that, that you felt like really created a, an awakening or an epiphany or a pivotal moment in your life? Actually, one that really sticks out in, in my life is actually in high school with my track coach. I ran track in high school and in college, but my uh, track coach, Coach Dees, was also my physics instructor. Wow. Just kind of in, in high school. Right? Wow. And uh, he sort of instilled in me the uh, drive to excel in two ways. He he took me on the track and taught me that I could reach down into my inner self to perform. And then he also, in the physics class, taught me that I needed to reach down into myself to be able to perform intellectually and mm. that it was important to blend the two. So I think that put me in a position to move forward. Uh, the other thing that was a, a big, important aspect in my life is when I actually went to the Naval, went to flight training. So I, uh, you know, I always wanted to go into space. So when you emulate the astronauts, it's all about becoming a pilot, a jet pilot, and being a, a test pilot, because mm -hmm. all of the early astronauts were test pilots. And I determined, you know, by my research that, of course, Navy pilots were the best. So that's why that's one reason why I wanted to go to the Naval Academy. But one thing I didn't think about was that if you're going to be in the Navy, you have to know how to swim. <laughs> and you ask me, what do I don't know? <laughs> well, at that time, I didn't know how to swim. <laughs> really? <laughs> and when I went to flight training, one of the first things they they did was you have to pass a swimming class and they they throw you into the pool and say, swim to the other side. Well, I, they threw me in the pool and I, I sunk like a rock, went right to the bottom. Next thing I knew, I'm I'm holding on to a, a pole and they're pulling me out of the pool 
and I'm coughing up, you know, chlorine. Right. And they said, you failed. <laughs> and I saw my entire future going away because, because I couldn't, you couldn't swim. swim. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> so my best friend, um, actually, um, he was best man at my wedding. And uh, he became an admiral in the, in the Navy, actually, Admiral uh, Arthur Johnson. Uh, we were uh, going through flight training in Pensacola at the same time. And we were, we, we went, both went to the Naval Academy. So we've known each other forever. So at, and he was in that class uh, and he failed too. <laughs> he couldn't so, swim either? Uh, yeah. So, so that, that evening, you know, we, we left the base and we went out and we, uh, we were licking our wounds, you know, to, we, we, we think we're, you know, we're everything, right? We're going through jet training or flight training at the, right. you know, in the, in the Navy, and we just failed swimming. You had to be so, a little pissed uh, off. We're that sitting, huh? Some, you had to be a little bit pissed off, Kevin, that <laughs> something like that yeah, could yeah. keep you from being a pilot. You're like, I'm going to be flying above it, not into it. Exactly. <laughs> and and it's like, so we're sitting on the, the curb, sort of shaking our heads, and uh, what are we going to do? And and he looked at me and he said, look, Kevin, we're not going to quit and we're not going to stop and we'll take all the extra swimming training they need to give to us until we pass this course. And if if I ever see you looking like you're going to quit, I'm going to kick your ass. Right? Yeah. yeah. You know? And 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 you're just not going to quit. And I looked at him and I said, you know, Artie, you're right. And if I ever see you decide that you're going to quit, I'm going to kick your ass. So we made a pact right there that neither one of us would let the other quit. And both of us, we did, they called it sub-squad, <laughs> remedial swimming. Okay. Every day for like for six months <laughs> in order to pass all of the swimming tests. But we both passed. We both got our wings. And we both became noble aviators, you know, but that was another lesson. Just keep pushing. Never, ever give up. Never, yeah. ever give up. And and also a good lesson is a guy that threatens to kick your ass is the right guy to be the first man at your wedding. <laughs> right, right? Exactly. <laughs> you know, he's got your back and you know, he's going to keep you in check for the rest of your life. Right. Yeah. So what uh, do you, uh, then this is probably way too deep on this topic, but <laughs> do you recall what it was who, that, that kind of made it click that made, I can do this swimming thing or. So I, I guess, and, and I, when I look back in my journey, it was, it was, it was um, sort of always having a plan, right? I always look, to what I wanted to do in the future. And I made a sort of unconscious initially, but it became a, a regimen of mine that every year I would make my five-year plan. You know, we talked a little bit about socialist countries. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I Five-year plans. Yeah, every year, exactly. So right. every year I would make my five-year plan about what I was going to be in five years and what I would need to do over the next five years to get there. Now, the plan always changed, right? Any plan I made always changed. But the mere act of thinking about the future and planning for the future gave me direction when things did change. And I, I think that's really what enables me even today to uh, keep moving forward. It's it's not that I'm smarter than anyone else or better than anyone else. No, I don't know um, about that. <laughs> but I'm guessing but, that you are smarter than a lot of other else's. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but really, it's, it, it's about thinking about where you want to be in the future and planning to be there. And that never say die spirit, man. Yeah, that uh, that that's just so impressive. So le let's let's turn to your your daily life a little bit. So, mm -hmm. what if anything? And currently, I know it's not bowling, and I'm sad for you in that regard. But outside of work, 
what do you spend your time on? And, and blogging, since you don't count that as work. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to qualify that as work. Okay. Yeah. So um, right now, actually, I'm in my home office most, most of the time. Um, I'm here. I really enjoy teaching, though. And you say, well, that's work. I said, okay, I'm sorry, but. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not if you say it's not, I guess. <laughs> so uh, I, I started working with the uh, Tulane University. Right. The uh, School of Professional Advancement. And. Everything that I've learned in my life, everything I've experienced in my life, the uh, work I've done in, in building companies and changing companies and leveraging technology, in a lot of ways, I feel that it's important and why and others should know and what I've learned. And I, I feel that it's, in a way, a duty to uh, teach others about my experience and, and my worldview so they they could leverage that that point of view as they go into the world um and i, I guess that's one reason why i find myself you know writing books every, every time i finish writing a book i say that's the last thing that's too hard i'm never going to do that again yeah and then three months later i'm trying to write another book <laughs> yeah. you know and it and it's it's like i, I want others to learn what I have learned so they can leverage and be better than, than me. Developing a course right now on developing and designing information systems. I developed a course earlier on diversity and inclusion in technology. And I don't really see it as work as much as I see it as a responsibility. I, I sense that. E even just looking at your profile, right? Your LinkedIn mm -hmm. profile or whatever. You can see the education in everything you do, including your companies, right? There is definitely that compulsion. And I really appreciate and applaud you for doing that because you do have a lot of knowledge. You have learned a lot. You've seen a lot. And you, I believe, can help people accelerate and catalyze their success because you can say, do this, don't do that. Is it as much for you about helping people avoid missteps as it is giving them the right answer? I'm curious. Well, what's right is different for everyone. And I can't tell you what's right for you, but I can tell you what I've seen in my life. Do you leverage any challenges other than your initial bout at swimming? I mean, were there <laughs> any other challenges that you had that you might call even temporarily a failure or such a struggle as to be oppressive, something you felt like something else you felt like you needed to overcome? Well, yeah. I mean, everyone has failures in life, right? I mean, I wanted to be a, a jet pilot and I actually got removed from the jet pipeline because my one of my very last check rides, I was actually, you know, when you're a jet pilot, you have to learn how to shoot down other planes. Mm. And I was in a test on how to shoot down other planes. I was in a, in a training aircraft and I was shooting at what's called a banner and I didn't do well. <laughs> and they actually said, so you're not going to be a jet pilot. You're going to go fly another aircraft. And I wound up flying um, Hawkeyes and, and Greyhounds, which was, a, was great, right? Uh, but at the time, I thought it ended my quest to become an astronaut because I was still pushing for that. But later, people, the NASA was looking for uh, people to go on the shuttle. And the uh, right. needs and requirements for becoming an astronaut just changed dramatically. So then I focused on becoming a system specialist, uh, a mission specialist to go into space. And what I've noticed is that not only does do things change in the world, but what you can do to realize your dreams change. So never give up on your dreams. So I could still go to space. Well, I didn't become a mission specialist because hypertension, but it was just, <laughs> it was just 
yet a, another thing, something that was outside of my control. Sure. But it didn't mean that I couldn't continue working in, in the space industry. And I actually had the opportunity to work on the New Horizon spacecraft to go to Pluto, right? And I, I worked with um, low Earth orbit systems for the, for the military. So um, I've really enjoyed being a part of the space industry, although I never became an astronaut. So you can say I failed by not becoming an astronaut, but in reality, I succeeded, you know, in doing so many other things. I would argue that you found a different path for success, right? Which is a common refrain. I'm sure you hear that all the time with yeah. all the people you talk to and educate and, and advise. Um, so many people had a, they had a vision for their life, but life had a different vision for them. Mm -hmm. Right. And sometimes it's, it's more, it's not even about failure. It's more about yeah. recognition. Yeah. But it's also about knowing yourself, know thyself. Um, know what you can control uh, and know what you can't. That's really, um, that's really mature. I'm going to have to write <laughs> that down and start using that at some point in my life. <laughs> um, but have fun. No yeah. matter what it is, have fun. That, that, that is a truth. I think the great Groucho Marx had something to say about that. If you're not having fun, what are you doing it for? To paraphrase. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for joining me for the first half of our interview with Kevin L. Jackson. Part two is coming next week. Don't forget to join us and listen up. And in the meantime, if you want to talk to Kevin, you can reach him on LinkedIn, gcglobalnet.com, kevinljackson.com, or on his Wikipedia page. How many times do you get to say that? All right, that is all you need to know about supply chain tech for this week, don't forget to get to supplychainnow.com for more Supply Chain Now series, interviews, and events. And now we have two live streams per week, the most popular live show in supply chain. Supply Chain Buzz is every single Monday at noon Eastern time with Scott Luton and me, or maybe even somebody else. Plus, our Thursday live stream to be named later, where we will bring you <laughs> whatever the hell we want. Hey, thanks for spending your valuable time with me. And remember, acknowledge reality, but never be bound by it. 